steps across the face of the earth uh, in order to show himself strong on someone whose heart is a worshiper, you know. He loves worshipers. Amen? Am I turned on? Yes, okay. If you've got your Bibles, let's hold them up in the air. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. And I will do what it says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. And I'll never be the same. Never, never, never. Never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to start out in Romans 5. I've got it in my sermon as a, uh, in the King James, but I'm going to read it. Started out here in the New Living Translation. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight, did you know if I could get anybody to believe one thing and really get it down in them, that's the thing I want them Because once you know you've been made right with God, you won't walk around with these feelings of insecurity. You won't walk around thinking, I don't deserve anything better. Well, if I could only work more harder at serving the Lord. Forget all that stuff. Jesus already made you right. Amen. Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. We know that they help us develop endurance. We talked a little bit about that Sunday. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with, with his love. When we were utterly helpless, turn to somebody and say, I was utterly helpless. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an, for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He'll certainly save us from God's condemnation. Are you glad about that today? Everyone say, Carol missed the Bible reading. So at any rate, we'll, uh, 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 we'll move on from this. Because in, in the fifth chapter, in the King James, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. I think peace with God is one of the greatest things that you can ever get down inside of it. Your spirit already knows that. But in the soulless realm, you need to know that. Uh, when you truly know that you have peace with God, uh, you won't go around with your works trying to impress God anymore. You won't be performance-oriented because you'll recognize that Jesus already did that for you. There's nothing more that I can do as a believer that's going to make God love me or appreciate me more. There's nothing that I can do. I showed my faith in him when I received him as Lord and Savior. And that faith has, has brought me to the place where I am. Man, thank God for this Bible. Thank God for his word that teaches us. You know, what you need is not so much inspiration as information. If you just have inspiration, that may pass away. That's why some people will come to a church and they'll, they'll have an emotional feeling. They'll say, oh my gosh, that's a place for me. But if they don't keep on having that emotional feeling, then pretty soon they'll go somewhere else. Why? 
because they're living off inspiration rather than information. But the Bible said that man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word. The thing that moves me on is a word. I remember one time when uh, so Debbie was raised in a very emotional Pentecostal environment. In fact, I was surprised. I didn't know people believed like this, but she believed, uh, she was in the church that she was part of, that if she was in a movie theater when Christ returned, she mi missed out. She'd go to hell. Uh, she believed that if she swam with somebody of the opposite sex in a swimming pool, she could forfeit her salvation. Everything pretty much forfeited your salvation. It was a legalistic Pentecostal church. And so she was pretty messed up with that. Uh, but she got, she got inspired, but what was she lacking? Not inspiration. She was lacking information. And then God sent Bob Caps into her life and started giving her some, some information that she really knew. Why? Because he said, you shall know the truth. He didn't say, you shall feel the truth, and that feeling will set you free. He didn't say that. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I told this story about a man years ago, and I'm going to say it again. He was a daredevil. He was a wire walker, and, and uh, they'd stretch a cable over Niagara Falls, and they had it real tight and ready. And as the crowd gathered, he would put people in the wheelbarrow and push them across Niagara Falls. Sometimes he'd push it empty. Sometimes he'd push it with somebody in there. This went on again and again and again. And can you imagine going over those falls in that wheelbarrow with that man walking on behind you, pushing it on a wire? No, they can't pay me enough money for that. So, so there was one man there that just watched it so long until his hair almost stood up. He was amazed at the ability of that man. So the man noticed he was really interested. After a long time, he turned to him and said, Do you believe I can do that again? He said, Man, you made a believer out of me. He said, I sure do. I believe you can do it again. You have been doing it all day long. I, I know you can do it again. He said, you don't believe I can do that again. He said, I surely do. No, you don't believe I can do that again. He said, I know. I do believe that you can do it again. All right, get in the wheelbarrow. <laughs> oh, well, that's a different story. You mean you want me to get in there and you push me? Well, I thought you believed. Yeah, I believe, but I don't want to get in. Well, then really, you don't believe. Believing on God, believing the Lord Jesus Christ is different than what some people believe it is. It, it's more than coming forward, saying a little prayer at a service, and then telling everybody the rest of your life, I accepted Jesus. But some people didn't. They never got in the wheelbarrow. They never really turned their life over to Christ. They know that he lived. They know that he's a real person. But there's a difference in saying I believe and saying it from your head and saying, I believe with your heart. Did you know that's the struggle that some people have today? They've said it with their head and not with their heart. And it, it took me a while to, to figure out why sometimes I'd preach one message after another about faith and standing up, believing God. And then some people, all I hear is unbelief out of their mouths. But it really started occurring to me that's because some of them don't, they only believe in their head, but they don't have a heart belief. When you have a heart belief, something changes on the inside of you. Something really changes when you have a heart belief. This guy with the wheelbarrow, he was somebody he could trust. But the guy watching, he just believed with his head, not with his heart. And too many people are doing that today. They're saying, I believe in Jesus. Well, guess what the Bible says? The demons believe and they tremble. The devil believes and he trembles at the name of Jesus. But many people say that they believe they don't even tremble at the thought of, 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 of an almighty God. I'm still blown away by my almighty God. I can usually tell whether where a person is spiritually by whether or not they still have an awe of God. If they're still blown away by God and all the good things that God does. 
There's a diff difference between believing with your head and believing with your heart. And there's a lot of religious people in churches today that will die and be lost. Because Jesus said, many shall say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Notice they called him Lord, Lord. And haven't we done that? He said, haven't I done many works in your name? And Jesus will say to them, Depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. What was the problem? They have a head belief, not a heart belief, not a life-changing belief. And that means that you can cast out devils in the name of Jesus. You can lead people to Christ because if they respond to the word you speak that comes out of the word of God, they're saved as if some preacher did. Don't make any difference who does it. They're responding to the word, and their 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 relationship with God is what's important. But the person leading them to the Lord could actually just have a head knowledge, and not a heart knowledge. Somebody said, "Well, they couldn't cast out demons." Yeah, they could cast out demons. Why could they cast out? Because it's the name of Jesus. Amen. To get saved, you got to. Take yourself out of your own keeping. You got to get yourself out uh, from thinking about what you can do and stop trying to save yourself. Stop trying to live good enough to go to heaven. Stop trying to live by the golden rule to say, now, that's my ticket to heaven. As ye would that men should do to you, do you likewise unto them. No, at that's a great verse. Jesus said it. But let me ask you this. Is that the ticket to heaven? No. So you've got to get yourself on solid ground there and you're not in the wheelbarrow. And when you get in the wheelbarrow, it means that I'm not going to trust in my works anymore. I'm not going to trust my baptism. I still have people who call me occasionally and say, listen, I've got to get some things right. And so I know I need to get baptized. I said, if you don't get things right in your heart, all you're doing is getting wet. I'm not going to trust in my baptism. I'm not going to trust in my goodness. I'm going to put myself at the mercy of God and trust only in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, first of all, that he's there to help those that don't have strength. I think that's where we miss it. And the King James said, "Yet w when we were yet without strength, Christ came and died for the ungodly. When we were without strength, Christ died for us. Without strength. So people today are in need of God, and there are people fit in that category that without strength. I don't believe I could have strength to live the Christian life. I don't think I could. You don't have the strength to quit your sins. How many people have figured out that you need a higher power to walk away on a daily basis? I had that discussion at this last funeral with somebody. He said, I, I made that decision. I said, I make that decision every day. I only get saved once, but I make a decision to serve God and let him guide me every day. Amen? You don't have the strength to quit your sins. You don't have the strength to break that illicit relationship that you've got. You're without strength. And people think that becoming a Christian, they'll, I've had people tell me, I just don't believe I can live it. There are more people say that than, if you're not a soul winner, you won't run on to that as many. But if you're a soul winner, you run on to those people who say, I'm not going to make a commitment to Christ and not be able to keep it. And they're really surprised when you say, everybody that ever made a commitment to Christ could not keep it. Because Christ keeps it. Now, get this. Christ keeps it. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He can keep my commitment to him. I made a commitment to him, and I am resting in his arms. People say, I can't give up my drinking. Well, I know that. You're without strength. 
I can't give up my drugs. Of course not. You're without strength. I can't give up this relationship with this woman that I'm living with and I'm not married. Of course not. You can't do that because you're without strength. I can't give up this unnatural lifestyle. I can't give up these habits. I can't. No, you can't because you're without strength. But Jesus came to be your strength. Thank God Christ died for you and you can be strong in him. Then it said Christ died for sinners. They're just sinners. They just live in sin. When Christians say they can't believe how other people live, why can't they believe that? There was nobody born in sainthood. You lived, you remember what it was like when you're doing whatever you wanted to do. That's why I never did agree with the people that just spend their time giving testimony about their salvation because they were an addict or, or uh, alcoholic or uh, a prostitute or, or whatever, you know. People say, man, I can't believe God saved that because you have the wrong thinking. It took no more power for God to save that person than it did the person who was raised in a church. Some of you were a lot worse than I am. You may be worse now. No, I'm just teasing. But this verse talks about Christ dying for sinners. Not only without sin. Some people say, well, I'm just a sinner. I could never change. That's right. You can't change, but Christ can change. I'm here to tell you today. I've had people say, I'm ungodly. Yeah, I know. Jesus came for the ungodly. I've had people tell me, you don't understand, I'm mean as the devil himself. Well, you think you are, but you're not. Christ died for people just like you, and just like me. You'll never, as a Christian, be the soul winner that you could be until you're finally settled in your mind and in your heart that you are no better than the person you're talking to. You're just saved. But you're not somehow a more... Uh, you weren't born a better person than that, that addict, uh, that person that's out on the streets. Or that. Uh, God didn't say, you're a good person, so I'm going to save you, but they're a bad person, so it's going to be hard to get them saved. Forget it. He puts us on all level ground. We're all lost without Jesus. I've even had people say, you don't understand, I'm a mean person. I have a friend. He's still a friend. Rough guy. Knows the Lord, but a rough guy. And one day he was saying, you know, we're getting ready to have a family reunion. I said, well, you've got to be looking forward to that. He said, I don't know. We're going to have 50 mean people together in one place. <laughs> I told him, I said, I'm glad you haven't invited me then. <laughs> if you don't realize you're a sinner, you don't qualify. You've got to realize you're a sinner. You've got to realize that before you come to Christ, you've got to realize you're a sinner. You've got to know your need for God. Then there's another class of people. He calls them the enemies of God, that many of these people were enemies of God. It's good to say uh, to you here and, uh, to, uh, and to people, wherever you find them, that he died for his enemies. Even while we were yet enemies to God, Christ did this for us. He died for those without strength. He died for those who are sinners, for the ungodly, for those who were his enemies. Well, I made a decision to get into Huyomar. And some people say, well, it's not, wouldn't be quite the same. It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same when you finally decide you're turning your life over to Christ. And I remember two separate events for me. I remember when I accepted Christ, and that was a tremendous thing. Uh, and I don't know if the, what the second event was. I don't know how to put a name on it. But I remember the time that I looked in the mirror one day and I said, my gosh, I'm saved. And that was years after I'd accepted Christ. I'm saved. I belong to the Lord. Every action that I take should reflect Jesus Christ. If you are a Nazarene, they call it sanctification, which is the second definite work of grace. I don't want to label it that. I'm just saying. 
there's a time when you come to Christ, but there's, there usually is a time in a believer's life when they go, oh my gosh, the Almighty God has reached down and grabbed a hold of me. And from that point forward, you're a different person than what you were even when you first got saved. Anybody relate to what I'm saying? Why I trust Jesus? I'm going to tell you why. Because like the guy in the wheelbarrow, I know I'm getting to the other side. Say that. I know I'm getting to the other side. Man, God's going to bless people who take themselves out of their own keeping and trust only in Jesus. There's something God does for you when you take yourself out of your own keeping. I'm going to put myself into your keeping, Lord. I'm going to trust you and you alone to save me. God's a giving God. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. He's a blessing God. I'll bless you, and I'll keep you. I'll make my face to shine upon you. He's a rewarder. The Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder. Say that, he's a rewarder. In other words, he doesn't subtract from you. He doesn't take from you. He gives to you, and he gives to you. He doesn't steal, he rewards he justified us. He's getting us to the other side. I've heard it said that justification is like just as if you'd never sinned. Well, I don't know exactly what the best definition for it, but I know it's right standing with God. God declares you not guilty. I think the greatest feeling a human being can have is when finally he realizes, I've been declared not guilty. Yet I remember yesterday I was acting like a fool. And yet, 2,000 some years ago, Christ declared me not guilty. Not guilty. He took all my sin. The ones that were past, the ones that are present, the ones in the future. Glory to God. I think about my record. And I think about your record. And God doesn't just kind of glance at it and say, I wish it wasn't there. One version said he acquits you of all charges. One of the versions of Romans 5 says, uses the word acquitted. The second thing he does is in that group of scriptures is, is he grants you peace, heart peace. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God. What does that mean? It's the word reconciliation, and it means that God's not mad at you anymore. You mean God was mad at me? Yeah, at one time. Because you were an enemy to God. But God loves sinners. So even while his anger was going to have to burn against, against you if you did not choose him, he turned his anger upon his own son. So he's not mad at you. He's been reconciled to you, and now all you have to do is be reconciled to him. In other words, he says, I give you the free gift of my favor, but your job is to accept that favor. And then you can have peace in your heart. By the way, you can't buy peace with money. Today, people think you can. If I had enough money, I'd get the things I want, and I'd do what I want. Well, I don't have a lot of money. I do what I want anyway. Some of my wants have changed. Peace can't come to you by climbing the corporate ladder. It doesn't come by owning enough gold and silver. It comes when you know Jesus is taking care of every problem of sanctification that you'll ever have. Thirdly, he says you have access to God. It'd be, I want you to think about that for a second. We're justified, made right in his sight, and he's made peace with us. But what good would all of that do? That would, that, would mean, that would mean that we have right standing with God. What good would that be if we couldn't access him, if we couldn't talk to him and have him talk back to us, if we couldn't learn from him, if, we, if he wasn't speaking to us? But he, he is. You have access. A lot of people don't feel like going to God. But when you come to Jesus, you have, you have the way to God. He's, he's given a heat. He says that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. There's never a time. You may have loused up, had the worst day 
uh, that you could ever have. But he, but he says having boldness to enter in by his blood. Jesus shed blood so you can boldly approach the throne of grace to obtain mercy. I love it. In your very worst day, when you say, you know what, I have acted like a, the, the south end of a northbound mule, but at the same time, I can boldly approach God because the access I have, I don't have because of my worth, but because of Jesus' worth. I can write a check on that grace. Amen? You have access. Fourthly, he lets us know something else. We have joy. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I didn't say happiness all the time. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to tell you that every time you hear something or see something that it's gonna, you're going to jump up and down and make you happy. No, happiness is something else. It's, an, it's something that affects you on the outside. But joy comes from the inside. And joy is where your strength is. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you find out that you have peace with God and you've been justified by God and you're in right standing with God and you're no longer fighting with God and God's not mad at you and, and God's not point, pointing you out, and I guarantee you we still have people in our local body here that are going through difficult situations that feel like God's not answering prayer and that God is, is against them somehow and they'll tie it back to some behavior they have. Forget all that because you haven't got a revelation of who you are in Christ. How many people think that God will refuse Jesus because Jesus wasn't good enough? He wouldn't do that, would he? Yet Jesus prayed, and Jesus always got his prayers answered. Jesus prayed that we would get a revelation that God loves us with the same love that he loved his own son, Jesus. That's way past any bad actions that I have. He loves me through it all. I wish people would see more God giggling up there than getting mad at him. They'd live a more peaceful life. I think it's more like God going, did you see that, son? Can you believe he did that? That's my child. The other day we were watching uh, Ellis. And man, Ellis could ask for something. we get it to him. And then he was mad that you gave it to him. It, it just had a day that was unreal. And uh, did you know that even though there were times and then it got on your nerves, didn't change the love that you had for our, your grandchild. You love your grandchild. You have little fights and battles. And he says, goes on to say that we glory in tribulation because of what God has done. These little fights we have down here, these little battles we have down here. Paul said, I reckon that the troubles of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. Man, God is getting ready to reveal some things inside of you that's going to blow your mind. And then at the end of this life, the life that's waiting for you is going to blow your mind. What I'm telling you is, don't be one of those Christians that thinks you've got to get to the other side to have your mind blown. Get your mind blown by God and what he does right here. And it'll even be better when you go there. Amen? Turn away from trusting in your good works. You're not that good. Turn away from, from uh, trusting in some church someplace, some golden rule you're going to follow. Turn away from all of that and just pray the prayer that makes a difference in all of our lives when you say, and man, do I remember this prayer. When basically you're saying, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know without Jesus I'll die and go to hell. And God, I really do want to be saved. So today I turn my back on my own life, my own efforts, my sins, and the world. And Jesus I know that you're alive from the dead. I want you to come into my heart and save me. Just as that man got in the wheelbarrow, I'm getting in today. And I'm placing all my trust in what you can do, not what I can do. You are my Lord. From this day forward, I'll witness for you. From this day forward, I'll never be ashamed of you. Now, you're my Lord and my Savior. 
And when I leave this life, I'm going to leave rejoicing. Can you say amen? amen? You receive that from the pastor tonight? Yes. Now, even though I've done a little bit early, it doesn't mean you can go pick up your kids early. <laughs> Let them finish what they're doing. Let's stand to our feet. And then remember the offering plates up here. And, uh, so you can just put your offering in there. Just raise your hands up. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That because of your sacrifice, there's nothing between me and you. There's no record to get straight, nothing to confess, except that you are my Lord. And so today, once again, I thank you for your divine favor in my life. And I'll walk as the child of God, trusting in his Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a clap offering.